glad to be with us at Twickenham today. I know that some of us are going through some tough times uh, right now. Uh, some of us have got some diagnoses that are uh, creating some fear for us. Uh, and you may be going through some stuff that nobody here knows about, nobody but you and the Lord and maybe one or two other people. That song is so encouraging to me in that regard because it, it, it calls us to praise God for his faithfulness, that he is there. And I hope that already you're encouraged by that this morning. Whatever you're going through, it's a good day to be with God's people and to sing praises like that. We'll do some more of that in just a minute, but right now, just glad you're here. Thanks for coming out. If you're a guest, we are especially glad you're here. And if you are looking for a church home, we'd love to talk with you about uh, what God is doing here at Twickenham. And then you could share what God's doing in your life, and we could explore maybe walking that journey together. That'd be a, a, a neat thing to do. There's a card uh, in the seat in front of you. You can uh, pull one of those out, put a prayer request on there if you'd like. Uh, we'd like for everybody to just give us a, a record of your uh, attendance this morning. But if you've got a prayer request, put that on there. We will be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning and through the week. Appreciate you can just put those, appreciate your sharing those with us, and you can put those in the collection plate in just a second. One quick note, um, if you see Steve Krieger today, uh, Steve's uh, one of our ministers here on staff, this past week, largely through his work, we rolled out a new website, or we refurbished our website. Take a look at that, twickenham.org, and if you see Steve, you can thank him for his hard work on that. He did a lot of work to get that thing ready. It also means that if you don't like it, you can complain to Steve Krieger about that, so, but I think you'll like it. Hey, let's stand together. I want, you, I want to read something to you from the book of Romans. Uh, just a couple of selected verses here from chapter 8 that really go, go along with that song, the couple of songs we were just singing now and lead us into is praising God for his mercy, his grace. Listen to this from Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all Thank you. 
went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. And then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed 
at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall through 18. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please calm us as we come to you today to take part in the bread and cup in remembrance for what you did on the cross. Let this meal bless our bodies and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Will you pray with me? Father, we drink this cup. And remember how Jesus was willing to lay down his life to glorify you and to bring our healing. Help us to honor this sacrifice by following his example. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. Speak what is true. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my.
I wanted to start this morning uh, doing a, a sort of a pastoral update on some of our folks that have been going through some health crises of late. Um, Carolyn Lewis has been in the hospital for, um, well, since last Sunday. Uh, and this morning at 9 o'clock, they were finally able to remove the breathing tube, and she's breathing on her own. So we're hopeful that that's a corner turned for Bob and Carolyn. Uh, a former member here at Twickenham of some years ago, Mae Davis, will be having surgery at Vanderbilt University Hospital. I think they moved to Houston, uh, and then uh, she'll be having surgery at Vanderbilt this week, so we want to keep her in our prayers as well. Mike Johnson is a member here. Mike will be having some surgery on Thursday, and we want to pray for him. Farrah Rawlings, who's downstairs right now working with our children. She works with Amy and the kids. Uh, Farrah will have a biopsy this week, and that's a thing that we want to be praying about as well. And then Janice Sanford um, got some good news this week. The tumors are stable for now. They've stopped growing, so we're going to pray for some reversal of that. So some good and some not so good in there. thought it would be a good idea for us to start with a prayer this morning, just about a lot of the struggles that we have going on here. So let's, let's bow together and pray. God, we love you, and these songs about grace and your faithfulness and your power and your love for us are deeply encouraging. And yet, Sometimes it seems that there is so much evidence to the contrary, and we'll just, we're being honest here. Sometimes we wonder if you're there. Sometimes we ask how long and why. And so in our moments of weakness and fear, we would ask your indulgence and your patience, and if necessary, your forgiveness because we are weak and afraid and sometimes don't know where to go or how to feel or what to do. We're grateful that you have blessed some of our folks here with, with progress in their medical issues, and their struggles, and yet others of us continue to struggle and have struggled for months years and so we 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 lift up all of those uh, in our number those at home those that we know about and we ask that you would heal and restore and if need be violate every physical and medical law on the books because you are god and you may do whatever you wish and we pray that it is indeed your wish to heal these people that we love, to heal us. Father, in the event that your answer is no, we believe there will be a reason for that, and we pray that we will have the faith to accept it and receive your love through your no as eagerly as we receive your yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, why don't you go ahead and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a minute. We are beginning a new series this morning titled, Gifted, Graced to Work. And that title all by itself can be a little bit confusing because it pits two historically competing concepts, or, or it puts two historically competing concepts on the same team, grace and work. If it's a grace, you didn't have to work for it, and if it's a work, it's not a grace. We just don't think those two things go together. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that there are a lot of us in the room, uh, myself included, who have worked pretty hard to overcome a theological background that minimized grace and lionized labor. Um, I don't know about you, but in the church I grew up in, it was all about work. You pretty much had to earn your salvation, or at least that's the message that 
uh, we came away with. That's not how it is, but that's the message we came away with. And so grace and work, to me, are just, it, it, they just don't go together. But in Scripture, those two concepts are not enemies. They actually complement each other. So why don't we just do that? Let's just begin with some Scripture, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Look, uh, look in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10. Let's listen together. For this reason, I'm sorry, um, I said chapter 2, didn't I? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who were disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So far, it's all grace, right? It is, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Again, it's all grace. It is by grace you've been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And then finally works show up in verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. But look at verse 10. For, in God, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But Paul is obviously comfortable talking on the one hand about the gift of grace and how our relationship with God is not based on works but on grace, but he's also comfortable, on the other hand, reminding us that we are created to do good works. Paul, in Paul's view, grace and work work well together. How could that be? You remember the first Superman movie? I think I've referenced this one before. It's the only Superman movie that was any good at all. The rest of them stink. Glenn Ford, which is one of the reasons it was a good movie, plays Clark Kent's aging father, aging earthly father. And then one afternoon, after school, Clark, the young Superman, is frustrated because he feels like such a misfit. So he shows off some of his superhuman powers. And that doesn't go very well. And his father puts an arm around him and gives him some wise counsel on life. Let's let's watch that clip together. Yeah, I know. You can do all these amazing things and sometimes you think that you will just go bust unless you can tell people about it, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, every time I get the football, I can make a <laughs> touchdown. That's for sure. Every time. Yeah. I mean, is it showing off and somebody's doing the things he's capable of doing? Is it, no. is it bird showing off when it flies? No. No, now you listen to me. When you first came to us, we thought that people would come and take you away because when they found out, you know, the things you could do, and that worried us a lot. But then a man gets older and he thinks very differently and things get very clear. And there's one thing I do know, son, and that is you are here for a reason. I don't know whose reason, whatever the reason is, you know, maybe it's because... Uh, But I do know one thing. It's not to score touchdowns. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dad. What, what Glenn Ford says to the young Clark Kent right there is true of you and me. God created us for a purpose. That means that you 
are not an accidental human. You are not an incidental human. You are not an unnecessary human. You were intentionally created for an important and eternal cause. Earlier in this service, we heard two passages of Scripture, one in which the young boy Jesus is in the temple, and he's, he's been missing for a couple of days, and his parents are beside themselves. And when they find him, his mother says what mothers always say to their children when they get into trouble. You know, do you realize what you're putting us through? And he says, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Or didn't you know that I had to be about my father's business? In that moment, Jesus knows that he's here for a purpose. He has been called to a cause. And then later on, we read, as he's, as he's dying on the cross, he says, it is finished. His life is bookended by an announcement of that purpose and an announcement that that purpose has been fulfilled. That was his life. I want to tell you this morning, that's your life too. Everybody lives for a cause. It may be a limited, landlocked, self-interested cause, it, or it may be eternal, unbound, and altruistic, but everybody on the planet, including you, including me, lives for a cause. And the cause you live for is going to shape your life. That's what the, the first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2 suggest. Now, I know that we spent some time in this glorious book of the Bible um, a couple of months ago. We, we didn't come anywhere near exhausting its teaching. I want to come back just to this chapter this morning. Later on in this series, we will probably touch again on chapter 4. But I want, I want us to think together about what this text teaches us about our purpose and our cause. In the first three verses, Paul offers a brutal description of life when it is live, lived for a self-interested cause. It's a life that begins not in the cradle, but in the grave. He says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. People who live for a limited cause are like the walking dead. Paul says, they follow the ways of the world, but he's not talking about a life of cosmopolitan sophistication. The ways of the world, its values, its priorities are governed by a personal force of evil Paul calls the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And of course, he's talking about the devil. Now, who in their right mind would follow the devil? Although I did know one guy who was literally dying. He was on his deathbed. He had days left, and he asked me to come visit him, and I visit with him, and I thought, oh, good. But he really wanted just to outline, he wanted me to do his funeral, and he wanted to outline what he wanted to happen at his funeral, and he said, I want you to play the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil at my funeral. And I said, no. So there are a handful of people who would follow the devil just for the sheer shock value of it, but most people, the kind of people you know, the kind of people we are, are not going to overtly, intentionally follow the devil, but that's exactly what Paul says they were doing. That's what he says we were doing. Look at verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time. If this were a trial, I would hope my lawyer would stand up and say, I object, but she'd be overruled. Please look at the middle part of verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Here's what that means. When you live a self-directed life, a life dedicated to the pursuit of autonomy, a life of self-governance, a life where your preferences, your desires, your wishes are the highest authority, if you live a life where you are the, the center of the universe and the most important thing in your world is you, if you're pursuing your cause and your purpose, then you are, Paul says, following the devil. 
You're doing exactly what the devil wants you to do because then it's all about you or it's all about me if that's what I'm doing. And if it's all about you, if it's all about me, it cannot be about God's purposes. It's about my purposes or your purposes. It's about my cause or your cause. And, and frankly, that makes God angry. We need, as Christians, we need to go ahead and say that, 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 that this happens. God gets angry. God gets angry when we live for ourselves, not for anybody else or for him. And there's no use, there's no use trying to spin the last part of verse 3. We were by nature deserving of wrath. God is loving and God is gracious and God is kind and God is forgiving. God is good and it is possible for God to be good and angry. And when he sees us living only for ourselves, pursuing only our own agendas, living for causes of our own creation, not for the purposes for which he created us, that makes God angry. Be a really good place right now just to sort of stop and ask is how you're living something that gives God a positive, happy emotion, or does how you're living make God angry? Are, are you living just for you, just for your purposes, just for things that are important to you, or are you living for the purposes? for which God created you. If we're not living for his purposes, that means that God is angry. So thank God for verses 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. In transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. God's anger lasts a little while. His grace goes on and on and on. And there's a really important lesson right here in these verses. A lot of us think, I must do something. I must do something to be worth saving. Maybe if I get my life straightened out, maybe if I get my marriage fixed up, maybe if I clean up my morality, maybe if I lick this addiction, then God will accept me. Then God won't be angry at me. Somebody in this room had some internal dialogue with themselves this week that went something like that. I love you, but if that's what you're thinking, you're wrong. Verses 8 and 9, Paul says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God not by works, not by sorting out your doctrine and making sure it's all sound or perfecting your performance or fixing what's broken. We are not free because of work we do for God. We, we, we're free because of the work God has done for us in Jesus. And the reason I want to start in, in this series, the reason I want to start with a huge emphasis on grace is because we're going to be talking a lot about work, about putting the church to work, about all of us, everybody in this room and everybody who's not in this room and, is, and needs to be, about putting all of us to work for the purposes of God, for the cause of Christ. We'll be, we'll be emphasizing work a lot, so I want to be sure that we lay a solid foundation and we understand that we, we are not free because of the work we do for God. We are free because of the work God has done for us. Are you with me on that? We have got to, that's where we've got to start. So that begs a question then. Why in the world did God think you and I were worth saving? I mean, if, if, why would God want to have a relationship with somebody who has a train wreck of a life, whose relationships make the Middle East look like a love fest, and whose practice of his will would be featured on the, on the greatest spiritual bloopers of all time, why would God want to have a relationship with somebody like me? Verse 10 answers that question. We are God's handiwork. Some 
People say that word handiwork means masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God thinks you and I are worth saving because he has an eternal purpose for us to fulfill. He created us for a cause that he dreamed before we were even born. God is doing, listen to me, God is doing something in the world, and he wants you and me to be a part of it. He wants us to be co-workers in his cause. Grace doesn't just save us. Grace gives us a mission. We are graced to work. It calls us, grace calls us to a cause. That's a really crucial piece of teaching we need to embrace. Because a lot of Christians don't think of themselves as having been called to a cause. They think of themselves as being members of a club. Club Jesus. We asked you some weeks back to read a book by Tom Rainer called I Am a Church Member. He talks about this way of thinking thinking of the church as a club instead of a cause. He says, for folks who think this way, membership is about receiving instead of giving. It's about being served instead of serving. It's about rights instead of responsibilities. It's about entitlements instead of sacrifices. Huge difference between a club and a cause. A club exists for the benefits of its, of its members. A cause exists for the benefit of the mission. A club exists only for those who qualify. A cause welcomes anybody who's willing to serve. In a club, the members pay dues. In a cause, in God's cause, the dues are paid. Club members expect to be served. In God's cause, we are gifted to serve. In a club, there are perks. In a cause, there are works. Being a member of a club is fun. Being a part of a cause, God's cause, is forever. God is doing something in the world, and he wants you and me to be a part of it. Let me give you a couple of handles here to begin to grip this teaching that we're going to be exploring for the next several weeks. Here's the first thing I want you to, to embrace. God has equipped you for this cause. He has equipped you for his cause. We're going to look at these scriptures again later on in this series, but Romans chapter 12, verse 6 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to, what are the last three words in that sentence? Say them with me. Each of us. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. First Peter chapter 4, read the first three words with me. Each of you should use whatever gifts you've received to serve others faithfully as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you. We'll, we'll talk about this some more next week. God created you to do good works, and, and he has gifted you, he has graced you to do them well. The gifts that every one of us possess come from the Spirit of God. That's the source. And God's Spirit uses our personal experiences, our education, our abilities, our talents, our aptitudes, our personalities to equip us for a role in what God is doing in the world. I believe that God knows exactly what he wants you to be doing, how he wants you to be using your gifts, and that you are especially needed in whatever part of the kingdom work is going on. Two warnings here. First of all, don't minimize the value of your gift, which is, I think, a thing a lot of us do. A lot of folks think they don't have a gift at all, that, that when they, you know, they were handing out gifts, you were not in that line. The Bible says otherwise. And then a lot more of us think that the gifts that we have are not very important. I'm not really talented, or 
I'm not educated or I'm not gifted or I don't feel like I have some grand purpose in life. I don't think I can contribute very much. I just don't bring a lot to the table. Why is it that we judge the significance of the cause with the size of our contribution? And how do you know your contribution to the cause is so insignificant? During World War II, a B-17 flying a bombing mission over Germany was hit in the fuel tanks with 11 20-millimeter rounds, hit in the fuel tanks with explosive rounds. Any one of those rounds, if they'd gone off, would have blown that bomber out of the sky and obliterated its crew. But none of the rounds exploded. 11 hit the tanks, none exploded. When they, they land the crippled airplane, and, and then the soldiers went in to defuse the shells that were still lodged in the tanks. The airmen discovered that the explosive shells were empty, except for a note they found inside one of the shells. It was written in Czech, and the note said, when they interpreted it, this is all we can do for you now. Some prisoner of war had done what he or she could do by loading a dud bomb. It, it, it may have seemed really insignificant. This is all we can do. But it wasn't to the airmen on that B-17 or their families. The cause, not your contribution to it, is what makes you matter. You, you may feel like, I don't, have a, I don't bring a lot to the table. It's not what you bring to the table. It's, it's the mission that makes what you have important. Here's the second warning. Don't waste the gifts God gave you on a limited, self-serving cause. I don't know exactly why God put you here. I don't know exactly why God gave you the gifts he gave you, but it's not to score touchdowns. It's not so that you can pursue some temporary course. Instead of building the kingdom of God, some of us use our talents to set up little serfdoms for ourselves. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm warning you, don't use what God gave you just for yourself. Use it for the kingdom. Very wealthy, a very wealthy man, a man for whom, maybe you've known some folks like this before, money was just not an object. He was determined to give his mother a birthday gift that would outshine every other gift he had ever given her, any gift any of his siblings were going to give her. He, he wanted to give her the, just the, the greatest gift. And so he read about a bird that had a vocabulary of 4,000 words. It could speak in 12 different languages and could sing three operatic arias in their entirety. So he bought it. He paid $112,000 for this bird, and he had it delivered to her. The next day, he called her up and he said, Mom, what'd you think of the birthday present? What'd you think of the bird? And she said, well, it was a little gamey, <laughs> but pretty tender. Don't, don't consume the gift God has given you on yourself. Peter said we're supposed to use those gifts, use what God has given us to serve other people. So the, the first handle here to begin to get a grip on this teaching in Scripture is that God has equipped you for His cause. He's given you something that He wants you to use to partner with Him in, in, in achieving His purposes in the world. The, the second handle I, I, would, I would give you is that when you do that, when you take whatever God has given you and you put it to work, in his kingdom for his purposes, that gives your life meaning like you've never experienced. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul said that we're created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Why are you here? You are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's, why, that's what we're here for. We were made to be a part of what God is doing in the world. It's our heritage, it's our destiny. Uh, Dutch theologian Soren Kierkegaard said, and now with God's help, I shall become myself. Y you are never who you were truly created to be unless you're living your life for God's cause. 
and using the gifts he gave you to do it. That's why you are here. 1957 World Series, I think it was game three, New York Yankees and the Milwaukee Braves. Yogi Berra, the Yankees catcher, was, he was a pretty good catcher, and he was a really good talker. He was constantly chattering behind the plate to distract the Braves hitters. He just, on and on, just the kinds of things, you can imagine the things that Yogi Berra would say to distract you. He just, on and on. And it was in game three, Hank Aaron came to the plate. And, and as Hank took his stance, Yogi Berra said, hey, Hank, hey Henry, you're, you're holding the bat wrong. You're, you're supposed to hold it where you can read the label. You can't hit like that. The label's upside down. Hey, Henry, you got to turn that bat around. You're just not, this is not going to work. Henry, you got to turn the bat around. Pitch came in. Henry Aaron hit it out of the park. He just blistered one into the left field bleachers. Then he rounded the bases. And when he came back by, he looked at Yogi Berra and he said, I didn't come up here to read labels. <laughs> when you use the gift God has given you, in service to his cause, then you have an answer for one of the most important questions you'll ever ask. Why am I here? Why am I here? You're here to do what God gifted you to do. You are graced to work in his purposes. Let's wrap this up with a memory. Do you remember that time you answered the phone, and the voice on the other end said, you got the job. You may have to go way back into the archives to find that memory, okay, because you've been at that job for a very, very long time. Or maybe for you, that call came just this week. Or you might have to imagine how that feels because you haven't received that call yet. But even if you have to imagine you know it is a really good feeling to get that call. You got the job. In 20, early 2015, Lisa and I were standing in our kitchen in Atlanta working on dinner when our phone rang, and it was Lincoln calling to tell us that your search committee, the shepherds and staff and you, were inviting us to come work with you. After all the praying that we all did, and after the interviews, and the questions, and the visits, the invitation was on the table. And I can't tell you how grateful we were to receive it. It is a huge honor to be invited to partner with a group of people doing important work. It feels good. That's what this series is about. God is calling, and his message is, you've got the job. He wants God, the, the God who created the universe wants you and me to partner with him in doing something amazing in the world. Because of Jesus, we're pre-qualified. And through his Spirit, God has gifted us to serve in ways far beyond our own abilities. He has put you here for a purpose. There is so much more to learn, of course, but for now, for now, we get to celebrate this amazing grace. We get to celebrate that our, that our God is calling us to participate with him. Let's stand, let's sing together and celebrate that one more time. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life.
thanks for being here. A few things as we close, and then Jim will come and offer prayer for us. There's a shower today for Megan Cooper. That is 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. Also, folks with Twi- Twi- in Twickenham Kids Program, that would be our preschool through fifth grade. You have a terrific Tuesday picnic here at the building, and there will be water balloons. So I know you don't want to miss that. Um, Nayati pre-registration for campers ends today. So if you want the discount for campers, please get those in today. Dinner and Devo tickets are available right out here. Uh, dinner this Wednesday is pot roast, mashed potatoes, and green beans. Um, or call the church office by Monday morning. And lastly, this, uh, Bill Bass's sister, Juanita Brummett, passed away Friday in Nashville. Please keep the family in your prayers. We sent out the details um, earlier this morning. There's a visitation today and another visitation tomorrow before the funeral. Those two visitations are in different locations, so if you're planning to attend one of them, make sure that you check and get the right one if you have those details. If we can do anything else, let us know. We hope you have a great day and a great week, and we'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I pray, we all pray that uh, as we perform the works that you prepared for us and will put before us in this week, that we will perform them the best that we can and that we will do them as a worship to you. That you will be, your name will be glorified and uh, bring praise to you through whatever we do. We thank you for the grace that we enjoy because of what your son endured for us. And it's in his name we offer this prayer. Amen.